so far we've gotten two laws of thermodynamics. The first one we kind of passed over. Um, it's, it's, well, it's not the first one. It's the zeroth one. Um, it's, it's in the book. I didn't discuss it much because there's not a whole lot there. Um, it's the one where the deal is uh, if uh, TA equals TB, just some temperature measurement, you, you uh, have uh, two things that you know to be at the same temperature, and TA equals TC, then, and here's the brilliant conclusion, that TA equals T, no, TB equals TC as well. Sounds kind of silly, but it is the nature behind how a thermometer works. That's what we rely on. We take a thermometer, measure the temperature of something that we know. Uh, historically, that's been something like boiling water uh, as one point and ice as another. And then if we use that thermometer to measure other things and it reads the same thing, then we assume that we've got a good temperature reading for it. So, uh, that's all there is to it. It's, it's not really a working law for us. There's not a whole lot we can do with it. But the first law that we just finished up our introduction to is a working law for us, and that's the law of energy conservation. We use it in the form that uh, uh, as heat goes in and uh, we produce some work of some kind, that will cause changes and considering other changes in the, uh, the system, remember that, that small e stands for the enthalpy enthalpy plus the kinetic energy plus the potential energy and even if those aren't equal and opposite to each other or, or those things don't all sum up to zero we still account for that as uh, a change in the total energy content of the system and we also have then a rate form of that uh, that we use as well for most of what we did in the last Ever, uh, the change in energy content of the system we took to be zero because we were looking at steady state analyses for the most part. And that was a, a very useful, very workable law for it, and very flexible too. Uh, certainly worked in, in a flexible way uh, when we were looking at heat exchangers because we could look at the heat exchanger as a whole and we could look at the individual fluid streams to uh, figure out what the temperature change or the mass flow rates or whatever it is we needed of either one. So the system as a whole may have no heat transfer and certainly no work being done. It's just a, a flow through system. But individually, we could look at a particular stream. And we knew that whatever heat one lost, the other picked up as long as no other heat was going in or out of the system. But even if that was the case, we could have taken care of that. And then, just to clarify, maybe we need more dots on the picture. It just gets better and better. It actually starts looking like a piece, a piece of, of uh, bark from a birch tree, which is dear and near to every Adirondacker's heart. All right, so we'll do. We'll, let's do a little warm-up problem with that, uh, just to uh, just to help us uh, uh, know some of the things here. This will help you actually if you need to like cook a, a frittata tomorrow because uh, imagine we have corn 
at zero degrees and eggs at 100 degrees. Now the reason I pick those is, well, one, they go very well together in a corn frittata. Those are yummy. But they also have about the same specific heat. The specific heat of both is right around 3.2. Kilojoules per kilogram degree K. So uh, it makes our, our calculation even easier. So what we, what we need to do is, uh, well, we need to cook the eggs. So we're going to heat up the eggs to about 120 degrees. So we know about how much heat that's going to have to, that's going to require because we know the specific heat. We now know the temperature change. So we can figure out about how much heat that would require. And that will allow us to predict that if the heat comes from the corn, we can predict then that the corn, since it has the same specific heat, if the eggs go up by 20 degrees, and as assume we have about the same mass of these, if the eggs go up by about 20 degrees, then the corn is going to have to go down by about 20 degrees as well. Just a, a simple first law analysis. If we want to heat up the eggs from 100 to 120, we only need to put them right next door to the corn and the corn will release enough heat to the eggs that the eggs will heat up and the corn will cool down and energy will be conserved. Everything will be fine. And we'll have corn frittata. <coughs> For frozen corn frittata. But eggs are more important than corn and we were able to cook the corn and we did so for free because the, the, we just took the heat out of the corn. Beautiful, huh? Beautiful idea. What? Nothing in here is important <laughs> for a degree. Is that what he said? Hair? There's hair? What? Chris, Chris did, did you hear him and you texted it to a friend? You're just going to drop it? Yes. Completely. <laughs> All right. Any any trouble with that scheme? Because we're hoping your mom will do that for us. <laughs> no violation here of the first law. We just took a certain amount of heat out of one item, put it into the other item, such that... Uh, no other heat, no heat was lost, no heat was introduced to the system. We can very, very easily predict what the temperature changes were going to be of the two. Any problem with it though? That's keeping you awake at night. Despite <laughs> your inability to express yourself. What? <laughs> uh, no violation whatsoever of the first law, is there? But clearly, this kind of thing can't happen. There's no way that if we put these two things together, the heat transfer is going to work such that this is the end result. If we do some other stuff, we could get that to happen. We could put the corn in the refrigerator and draw out the heat that way, but that requires a refrigerator that needs to be plugged in. All kinds of things have to go on to get that to happen. There's no way that this kind of thing is going to happen spontaneously, on its own. We can't put those two things next to each other, have heat go from the cold one into the warm one, resulting in the change temperatures that we have below. It's just not going to happen. Hopefully, you know that. 
What we don't know is how to understand that that won't happen because there was no violation in the first law that that happened. That, that, that everything's just fine there. That amount of heat transfer is going to do just that kind of thing for us. So we need something more. And that's going to be, lo and behold, the second law. Now, we're not quite there yet to present that law, but we will. What it's going to do for us is tell us not only must we conserve the first, not observe the first law, not, not only must we obey the first law, but that there's prohibited directions in the first law. There's only certain ways that the first law can go in the natural world. As we saw there, this violates the type of things that can happen in the natural world. In, in a spontaneous thermodynamic uh, situation. Alright, so we need a couple things first before we get to the first law. One of the first things we need is a definition of what's called a heat engine. A heat engine is, is something that uses heat to do something for us, that uses the transfer of heat to do something for us in a, in a reasonable way. So a very simple model of just such a heat engine will be something like this. Imagine we have uh, a gas of some kind under a perfect piston and I've got a couple stops on the piston there so it won't ever drop any below that. So just some working gas in here. Uh, <coughs> And we'll look at what happens to this system on our favorite of all diagrams so far, the PV diagram. The reason that's nice is because remember the area under a pressure volume diagram is the work done in any particular process. So that'll help us help us look at that. Alright, so to start things off, we'll add some heat to this system by drawing heat from a high temperature reservoir. What I mean by a high temperature reservoir is, well first of course it's at high temperature. By high temperature I mean higher temperature than what it's next to, which is the gas. We're going to transfer some heat from that high temperature reservoir into our little system. <clears throat> the other thing that's important about a high temperature reservoir, or any temperature reservoir, is that it's large enough that the loss of heat or the gain of heat, because we're also going to have low temperature reservoirs to which we'll release heat, they're large enough that their temperature doesn't change. So uh, the, the ocean would be something like that. If, if you go swimming in the ocean and you lose heat to the ocean, well, unless you have 15 drunk friends in the ocean, only 13 of whom actually make it out, I'm sure. Uh, if you go swimming in the ocean and lose a little heat to the ocean, the ocean doesn't really know you were there. The temperature of the ocean doesn't change so appreciably. That's the type of thing we mean by heat. That way we, we don't have to be concerned with what makes it up, what mass does it have, what specific heat does it have, what temperature does it We don't have to worry about those things. We've got as much heat as we need, and we've got as much place as we need to release heat later. So we're going to introduce a little heat to there. designated and of course Q, but I'm going to call this Q12 because this is going to take us from our initial state 
of the system just sitting there getting ready to be used. And uh, to our second state where we're going to now let the gas expand and uh, 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 increase. So we're starting at low volume. and uh, low pressure. Now to, to make sure it's actually an engine that does something for us, we're going to have over here some mass that uh, we have and we're going to put that onto the engine and our engine as simple as it is, its job is to lift that. So that's our original, our, our, that's, our, that's our start. And so we'll pump in some heat. What? And sit by him. And we'll have a stop there that'll keep the uh, keep the thing going from any higher than that. Okay. First thing we need to do is uh, we need to add enough heat that the pressure inside here becomes enough that it can actually start to lift the mass. At first, the pressure in there won't be enough to lift the mass, and that's partly because the, the piston is down on these stops and couldn't drop down any lower when we put the mass on. When we put that mass on, the uh, piston doesn't drop any lower, so we're at a pressure in here that's not great enough to actually lift that mass. So the first thing we need to do is increase the pressure to some point where now we can start to lift the mass. So this is the this is a, a the piston is actually at the same place for both state points one and two but they're of different pressure. So I'll label that uh, Q12 goes in there to cause the uh, pressure to increase enough to uh, the point where we need to be. That will be then enough to lift the mass. Now, now the pressure's high enough now we can start to lift the mass. Now the piston will start to float. So that will be the process up to point three. How would that look on the PV diagram? Starting from point two, because we can't jump away from any state point, we have to continue from there. That's, that's, what, that's what our piston cylinder business does for us for the most part. As long as it's a freely sliding uh, piston, we don't change the mass on it any, then we'll have a constant pressure process over to some point three. then the work done from two to three. Is it positive yeah. or negative? Or can we tell? Because there's no numbers on here. I got a couple positives. Now I understood that. What was your problem before? I said you didn't solve it. I know, but... <laughs> You said it was such conviction. It was actually understandable. You can say something loudly and still mumble. 
It's positive. We know that because the area under PV diagram is the work done during that process, and this is a positive area because we're above the axis and we're going to the right. All right, then we remove the mass because that was the job to do. When we pull the mass off, what happens to the piston? It would go higher, but don't forget there's stops here. So we've got to get the piston back down because we have more mass we need to pick up and move up upstairs, if you will. So to get the mass down, we've got to cool off the gas. We'll do that by now rejecting heat to a low temperature reservoir. And that will be Q34 to get us back down. So that'll bring us down to four. And it'll come all the way back down to whatever the original pressure was. That'll be good enough for us. Oh, sorry, we'll reduce the pressure, then it will fall. So here's the pressure reduction, then here's the fall itself as it actually goes back. So and it, it actually stays there at four. So we pull out the heat till the pressure is low enough that it starts to drop. And once it starts to drop, that's a constant pressure process. So that's what we need. So that'll be the heat transfer three to four just to cool it down to drop the pressure, even though the piston doesn't move yet. Then once we've done that, it moves, starts to move. Uh, and the and the uh, the plate still now drops and it brings us back to our original situation where we're back to the original pressure, the original volume. We can put on a new mass, heat it up again, raise that, pull the mass off, and we got ourselves an engine working for us in a cycle. Let's, uh, let's analyze that cycle. Let's see, Q net minus W net equals, uh, it's a closed system, so whatever mass is in the system stays in the system. And then for the whole cycle, this will be one all the way around to one. look at our usual pieces. So we introduce some heat to increase the pressure. Then we raise the weight. Then we took out some heat to reduce the pressure. The plate dropped back down, brought us to our original place, and then we can start all over again in a cycle. So every time we go through this, we end up exactly where we started, at least in terms of the, the gas itself. We accomplished something because we got some mass raised doing this, but we end up at our original starting place in terms of the gas itself. So are any of these term zero? is Q net zero. Well, it might be, it depends upon the magnitude of those. We're not real sure how big those are. It could be that one of these is bigger than is the other. I'm just not sure yet. So uh, we don't want to cancel that out. Is the net work zero? That we can answer. We can answer whether or not this net work 
is zero. What do you think, Mumbles? The network is not zero. But I heard it. Who, who, who thinks which? You guys disagree? Yeah. Phil, what do you think? Is the network zero? Not sure about this one yet. This one we can be a lot more sure about. Is the net worth zero? Yes or no? I got a yes, it is zero. I got a no, it's not zero. I got a no. Phil's not going to play along. Phil's dreaming of the beach. <laughs> Dana? No, it's not zero. What? That's not true. You might be smarter. <laughs> Taylor thought that was a pretty funny idea. <laughs> Taylor, yes or no? Is the work zero? The net work zero? Yes. No. No. Yes. No. 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 Did I get everybody? Oh, I didn't get Phil. Phil's not going to play along at all. Phil, you have to break the tie. You <laughs> were exactly tied. Is the network zero for once around the cycle? No, it's not zero. Didn't sound very confident. Who's confident in their answer? You're confident that you're wrong? No, you're not confident? No, you're confident? Maybe you're confident? Uh, what was your answer? No. no, it is not zero. The, the, this term is definitely not zero. Right? I understand you're right. Uh, you're right. How can you convince us? How did you come to understand that? Uh, not bad, not bad. Somebody want to? He's, he's very, very close. Anybody want to amplify on that? We have a net positive area. So remember, this was the positive work done in one part of the process. This is the negative work done, or the work done on the system. It was done by the atmosphere, actually pushing the plate back down against the volume. Uh, the difference between those two is the net work. And that difference between those two, that area is definitely positive, definitely non-zero. Not only non-zero, but positive. So we know that the work net is not equal to zero and in fact greater than zero. It didn't. That wasn't the case. The amount of work is the area under the process curve on a PV diagram. The area under this curve going from 2 to 3 is much greater than the area under the curve going from 4 to 1. Much greater. Okay, so that helps us there. We know that's not zero. We're not sure about this. What about delta U? Remember, this is the change in the internal energy of the gas in the system going from 1 all the way back to 1. What's delta U? Is that 0? Is that greater than 0? Or is that less than 0? What? I'm going with zero again. You're going with zero again because it worked so well for you last time. Huh? I think that one's zero. We've got a little little trio over here. The 
hold hands in unity. Bill hates that kind of group thing. <laughs> or hates it unless it has 15 people in it. Is delta U for once around the cycle zero? Yes. Yes, it is. Because we're bringing the system back to where we started. Remember, we need two independent intensive properties to fix the state point. We have P1 and V1, they're independent and intensive, which means we fix the state point, which means everything else is returned to its original value as well. So that's zero. Delta PE. Yeah, the system returns to the same height. Of the, the, the masses are not part of this thermodynamic system. That's part of the, the thing we need to accomplish. It's the gas of this thermodynamic system. And its potential energy didn't change. And KE. Which leads us to a very important conclusion. that for a cycle, the network equals the net heat transfer. And equivalently, if we needed, we could put that in rate terms. Or we could put it on a per mass basis term as well. It doesn't matter, especially for this closed system. Any one of those will, will uh, 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 we can conclude. So that's our idea of a heat engine, but that's a nasty diagram to draw. So we're going to simplify the diagram and work from there. Our diagram will look something like this. We have some high temperature reservoir from which we will be able to draw heat as needed. That could be uh, the combustion of a bunch of natural gas like in Malcolm's dad's plant. It, well, it's not actually his plant. He just runs it. Right, Malcolm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it could be, uh, I, I guess, the sun supplying some kind of thermodynamic, uh, uh, some kind of count as a high temperature reservoir. Doesn't matter particularly. It's going to supply heat, and we'll call it QH because it's from the high temperature reservoir. There's our engine. And that can be either the little piston thing we just had, or it could be a thermodynamic plant, a, a real power plant. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it's going to supply some work for us. What we do with that, do we want to raise masses with it, or do we want to turn an electrical generator? And then, there's some heat rejected to a low temperature reservoir. And that's our little cartoon picture of a uh, heat transfer engine. If, uh, if you'd rather, you can look at it like this. A certain amount of heat comes out and we can draw that by the width of that arrow there to give us an idea of how much the amount is. And then some of that goes to producing work, whereas some of it is then rejected and you can use the actual sizes of the arrows to, to 
illustrate that idea. But that's too hard to draw. Especially under the incredibly credible eye of some of the audience for some of the drawings. What? AJ. This guy? You have a nickname for him? You did. Great. All right. So that brings us then to the second law as we're going to use it. In fact, there's two ways to state the second law. And not in any particular order, the clausiest statement of the second law, Clausius was just the one who, who uh, proposed it. No heat will spontaneously That means without us doing anything, no heat will spontaneously move from a cold body to a warm one. It's actually not a law telling us what we can do, it's a law telling us what we can't do. Kind of like speed limits that I'm sure most of you ignore anyway. Well, we, we just common sense tells you that's the case because even when we talked about the corn frittata, nobody raised the... Uh, raise the concern that, oh yeah, we could do that, because the first law says we can. First law says we can, but the second law says we can't. So that's the first statement of the, uh, of the second law. So for our heat engines, it would look something like this. Here's a high temperature reservoir, a low temperature reservoir, we have some, some contraption in there such that heat will leave the low temperature reservoir, go into the high temperature reservoir, and nothing else goes on. That kind of thing won't happen. That's what we just said we were trying with the cold corn and the hot eggs and heat, having, and heat going in that direction. So we'll put a big international no can do symbol around that. So that's the first statement, the first form of the second law. Gives us an idea of the direction of things. This picture does not violate, oh sorry, this second one here should be an, uh, uh, an H. Well, I guess it would have been an L too, it would have to be the same size. Because there's no heat going anywhere else. Um, the second form of the second law is also the same kind of thing. It tells us what we can't do. It's known as the Kelvin Planck. Kelvin Planck form of the second law. It says no heat engine can run in a cycle. cycle such that all 
all of the heat taken in, and that's that's our uh, that's our QH uh, uh, from the high temperature source. No engine can run in a cycle such that all of the heat taken in is formed into work. All of the heat. Some of the heat can be turned into work. We just showed that with our little uh, toy heat engine lifting the masses on the piston. What this says is for an engine to run in a cycle where it takes heat from one source, produces work, and nothing else is impossible. There must be some heat rejection to a low temperature source somewhere, somehow, for it to operate in a cycle. And we saw that with our little piston thing. We needed to do that to reduce the pressure enough that then the piston would start to drop. If we didn't reduce the pressure by pulling off heat, the piston wouldn't have dropped and we couldn't have run it in a cycle. We couldn't have brought it back to the original spot. Chris? So a steam turbine wouldn't fit to that? Yeah, this, what this says is we can't get a certain amount of heat from burning coal or natural gas or whatever and turn all of that heat purely into work. We're going to have some waste heat that we have to reject to get it to work in the cycle. Yeah. Also though, inefficiencies guarantee that as well. This isn't even mentioning yet the efficiencies. Uh, is this concept also applies to incandescent light bulbs, how you have a split of uh, light energy and heat energy produced when you use one? Yeah, you'd, you'd never be able to put in a certain amount of electricity, have that equivalent electricity turned into light energy without any kind of particular. However, that's not really a cycle. That's not something operating in a cycle. So this needs a, a big international no can do symbol as well. So those are our two forms of the uh, Second law that tell us which way we can go and which way we can't go. Flush. Oh my goodness, it's getting soggy back there. And who was that? Was that you, Trevor? Yeah. Nothing worse than the biggest guy in the class sneezing. All right. So let's look a little more closely at just what it is we're talking here, talking about here. Uh, a power plant is typically, uh, at least a steam power plant, the type we're going to see at, uh, at uh, up at INDEC, is typically a boiler and something is burned to produce heat such that the water running into the boiler then, of course, boils into high temperature steam high temperature, usually high pressure as well, but uh, the pressure doesn't come from the boiler, just the change of phase from liquid to vapor. Then that vapor is run through a turbine or if you'd rather a turbine so that you don't think it's a turbine like, a, like people wear in India. What? Turbine sandwich. What's a turbine sandwich? It's a Reuben and turkey. There's a name for that? Yeah, it's a turbine. <laughs> Is that a Reuben and like, a Reuben and Is there a turducken bin? <laughs> if you want, yeah, why not? Yummer. Alright, so the high temperature, um, high pressure steam goes into the turbine. That produces work at the turbine, that's not the same as the net work, as you'll see in a second, then this is now generally much lower pressure 
It's then run through a condenser. This is where it's turned from whatever remaining vapor it may have into a compressed liquid. To do so, of course, it must release some heat. And that may be to the atmosphere, or it may be to a lake or a stream or the ocean, whatever's available as the heat, heat source, uh, the heat sink there. And then, oops, can't have this stream turn colors. Then it's run into a pump where the pressure is now increased and put into the boiler uh, wherein the cycle begins again. And of course a pump is going to take a little bit of work to run. Usually uh, that's taken right off of the turbine work or the turbine work goes into an electrical generator then some of that electrical energy is used to run the pump. And again, for any system running in a cycle, the network out equals the heat transfer in. The network is the turbine work we produce minus whatever little bit has to be sent back to run the pumps. And the heat transfer is the difference between that pulled in and that rejected. So that's, a, that's about as simple as a steam power plant can be. There are a lot of other things done. We won't get the chance to talk, to, uh, talk about many of them. Uh, for example, one of the concerns with the turbine is that you don't pull out so much energy that it starts to recondense where you then have liquid water droplets inside the turbine hitting the turbine blades. So what they'll sometimes do is pull it out midway, reboil it, reintroduce it, and then that keeps it well out away from the dome uh, and reduces the chances of those kind of things happening. The reason this is done, condense it and then pump it, is because that takes an awful lot less work to pressurize a liquid than it does to pressurize a vapor if we still had one back here. So, what we need to look at now is what's called the thermal efficiency. The symbol we use for efficiency is eta. Now we'll put a little th there to designate we're talking about the thermal efficiency because there are other types of efficiencies we'll need to talk about. For example, uh, once the turbine work goes to the generator, electrical generator, the electrical generator cannot turn all of that work into electrical work. There's going to be some losses due to the mechanical efficiency of the generator. But all we're talking about is the thermal efficiency. In general, the efficiency is defined as the benefit over the cost. The benefit of doing this is getting some net work produced. It's not the turbine work because we lose some of that. It's the net work that we expect as the benefit of running the system. And the cost is the heat we need to supply to it, QH. Now, remember those are thermal terms. There are other costs, of course. There's a lot of cost to 
environmentally disposing of this heat in a way such that it doesn't do damage to the to the, the fish and the birds and the people. Even people. But our network we know to be QH minus QL. So that's over QH. Or this is 1 minus QL over QH. And so we can figure out the thermal efficiency of uh, these plant plants and start to get an idea of what we can and can't do with these. Oh, I wish I hadn't erased that. The Kelvin Planck statement. Well, you remember what it was. We cannot take all the heat into a system and turn it all into work. What does that mean in terms of the thermal efficiency? Well, thermal efficiency is uh, work net over QH. Kelvin Planck's statement says we cannot take all of that heat and turn it into work, which means that this cannot be 100%. That's ignoring even the inefficiencies due to friction and mechanical misfits and other kind of things that, that are reality part of life. Even if we could make it perfect, even if I went to Ace Hardware and went back to their steam power plant division and asked Earl for my own steam power plant, even he could not supply me with an 100% efficient one. So don't go asking for one. He'll just laugh you right off the site. Now, why is it that um, when steam comes out of the turbine, it's it's still steam, but just barely. Why can't they just cycle back to the boiler? Do they not have a way to keep the system moving and push that steam back? They, 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 well, they can't because the boiler's at high pressure. Yes. If the boiler's at high pressure, then the boiling point is high, so it has more energy in it. And this comes out at low pressure. You can't get a low pressure for stream to flow into a high pressure system. Natural, yeah, there'd be backflow. I see. So they need to pressurize the stream to get it into the boiler, and it's a lot more efficient to pressurize liquid than it is vapor, so the condenser. Okay, I see. So there's there's our 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 system analysis for the Kevin Planck statement in a picture. Um, same thing as saying that QL cannot be zero either. There's got to be some heat rejection to complete the cycle. And don't forget that all of these can also be uh, rate terms as well. Where that, that depends upon the mass flow rate through the system. Okay, one other thing we can introduce Even though the Clausius statement said that we cannot make heat go from a cold substance to a warm substance, we can't make heat go from our ice cream, especially if it's ice cream made by perhaps the best ice cream makers in the world, even though they don't make the single type of ice cream that was the best type of ice cream in the world. They stopped doing that. Heavenly hazelnut. It was the best ever. It's sold in Morocco. It's, it's hashish. <laughs> That's what it's called. Heavenly hazelnut. What kind of ice cream? Is that what it's called? <laughs> anyway. Anyway. 
We do know that somehow there's a way to pull heat out of that because it not only is frozen at some time, but it stays frozen. So we're pulling heat out of that somehow, even though heat's coming in from the room. Uh, somehow, we do get heat out of the ice cream, rejected to most likely the room, because that's where the refrigerator sits. We can't do that spontaneously. We know that from the Clausius statement. Plus, just common sense tells you it's just not going to happen all on its own. But we can do it by putting a type of heat engine in there where we supply work to that heat engine and we can cause it then to draw heat from the ice cream, reject it to the room. And you know this is a refrigerator. This is what your refrigerator does. You plug it into the back so it runs. They don't work very well if you don't plug them in. Might want to test that at home for extra credit. That will draw heat away from the ice cream and reject it out the back. If you ever feel in the back of your refrigerator, it's nice and warm back there. But how that works goes like this. Uh, we'll, put, we'll put the ice cream, we'll put the ice cream down here where it was. So that's our low temperature reservoir. Uh, even though we're taking heat from the ice cream, it stays at about the same temperature because there is still heat coming in from the room just through the walls of the refrigerator. That QL goes into an evaporator. An evaporator, well, it's very much like a boiler. Heat comes into it, it turns a liquid in it to a vapor. Then that's run into a compressor. Because what's going through the evaporator is at very, very low pressure. I'll show you how we make yeah. sure of that in a bit and we'll finish the cycle. But if this is at very, very low pressure, the boiling point is also very, very low. Low enough such that the temperature of the ice cream causes it to boil. So this is very low pressure. Goes through a compressor where the... the uh, where the pressure is increased, if the pressure is increased, it also increases the boiling point. Increases the boiling point up to around where it's the, at the room temperature. And then that releases heat out the back of the refrigerator. And now remember this is the high pressure. We need to get it down to low pressure. There's two ways to do that. We could run this through a turbine because we've already seen from steam power plants that turbines cause the pressure to drop a great deal. We could get work doing that. We could use some of that work to actually run the compressor on the other side. The problem is, for a home refrigerator, that's horribly complicated. You, it's just not worth it to have a steam turbine in the back of a refrigerator just to produce little tiny bits of work. So it is then throttled through an expansion valve. That causes the, temper, the pressure to reduce a great deal. Now that the pressure is low, it can go back into the back of the refrigerator where the ice cream is cold enough to make it boil because the temperature boiling point is so low that we then have a, uh, a refrigerator work in that way. But they don't work if you don't plug them in to supply work to the compressor. I'm sorry, Chris, is that making you hungry? 
No. The ice cream? No. You don't like ice cream? You don't like Stewart's ice cream? Hmm. I love Stewart's ice cream. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that whole loop is then very low pressure? Uh, well, this part of it is very low pressure. Right. Relatively low. This part is high pressure. Uh, if you look back at the uh, the steam power cycle, that was kind of the same too. Half of it was high pressure, half of it was lower pressure. The reason that's done though is to get the very big differences in the boiling point here. So that this will condense at room temperature, this will boil at ice cream temperature. Or lower. Now, the thermal efficiency of refrigerators is not called that. So if you wrote that down, you just wasted time and trouble and effort. Thermal efficiency of a refrigerator is known as the coefficient of performance. COP. And as you'll see in a second, we have two ways to look at that. So this is the COP of a refrigerator. Again, defined as the benefit over cost. What's the benefit of running a refrigerator? Yeah, QL. And the cost of running the refrigerator is the compressor work. Now, the, the reason these aren't called thermal efficiencies is because this can be greater than one. And it doesn't make any sense to talk about a uh, an efficiency that's greater than one. So that's why they're called coefficient of performance. Oops, forgot to put the high, high temperature reservoir there. Now, that's a refrigerator cycle. This very same cycle can be run for a completely different purpose. The purpose of the refrigerator is to transfer heat from a cold place to a warm place. Or actually transfer it out of a cold place. We could also run this cycle where the purpose of running it is to supply heat to a higher temperature place. For example, this is the cold outdoors. This is your house. You want to supply heat to your house in the winter to make sure the temperature of your house is higher than the temperature of the outdoors. And this is then known as a heat pump. Heat pump is just a refrigerator run for a different purpose, for the purpose of supplying heat to the place that's already warm. We don't care that we're taking heat out of a place that's already cold it's winter in the Adirondacks. It's just going to get colder anyway. Uh, actually, heat, the heat pumps don't run all that well in extremely cold temperatures. But it does have a different coefficient of performance. Still defined as benefit over cost. It's just that the benefit is different this time. Now the benefit is QH rather than QL. The cost is still the work of running the compressor. At the temperatures at which water works, this cycle doesn't work well, which is why it's run with refrigerants instead. And that's where our refrigerant 134A comes from as well as many of the other refrigerants in use nowadays. So uh, everybody 
up to the uh, Stewart's in Corinth for free ice cream cones. <laughs> on the house. Just a cone part. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It depends on how nice they are there. All right, there we go.